everybody. Welcome to the next session of Spill the Tea. My name is Fawaz Abdulaziz. I'm an analyst with the History and Regional Studies program of the Penang Institute. And with me is... Hi, everyone. My name is Pei Zhong, and I'm with the Social Economics and Statistics program at Penang Institute. Hi. So welcome and uh, welcome back to those who have been listening to Penang Institute's Spill the Tea uh, podcast. With us today is Professor Yusin Kwa, the Albert uh, Winsemius Chair, Professor of Economics at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Uh, welcome, Professor Kwa, and thank you very much for uh, gracing us with your uh, presence today at Penang Institute. So maybe uh, Pei Jung can start off the podcast with her questions. Um, Professor Kwa, thank you so much for joining us today. So today we are going to be talking about valuing homemakers and why is it important that we put a value on household production and how does the appreciation for homemakers um, come into this topic. Before we start, Professor Kwa, you obviously had a very long and a very impressive career and you've covered and researched many different areas of economics. Can you share with us perhaps um, what are your main areas of interest in economic research? What's important to you and why do you feel that is so? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm happy to be uh, doing this for the Penang Institute. Uh, the question that you asked me, you know, I, yes, I have a very long career, but uh, my interest in research has always been the same, which is on trying to do valuation issues. So this I picked up from my courses in university days when I do uh, study on cost-benefit analysis and environmental economics. So central to these two subjects, there's always the section on valuation. And I find it very enthusiastic on my part to try to value things which are hard to value. And hard to value means primarily things which are outside the market. So market, there's prices. Mm -hmm. Non-market goods don't have prices. And so household production is one form of non-market goods. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, how do you put values on such things? So I, I take great interest in trying to figure out, you know, how do we value such things from an economic standpoint? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So um, on top of that, so going forward to today's topic, so we are, as mentioned earlier, we are going to be talking about valuing homemakers and household production. So first of all, Prof, can you maybe enlighten us a little bit on the definition of household production? What does it mean in this context? And what exactly falls under household production when we are talking on how to value them? Yeah, household production simply means uh, you know, uh, things which are produced at home. Right? That's why it's household production. Mm -hmm. right? There are many uh, definitions for it, but central to all these definitions is basically that you combine both uh, effort, time and money mm -hmm. Uh, with, uh, combine market goods uh, in terms uh, mm. with your time to produce goods at home, such as uh, cooked meals, clean floor, a disciplined child. You know, all these things constitute the home goods. Right? And so, household production, um, with, despite all these various definitions, uh, uh, it focuses on these particular aspects. Now, in my own work uh, early on, I have defined household production in terms of having the following characteristics. One is that those goods produced at home which are market replaceable. So can you find someone from the market, a maid or something, to, re to produce these goods at home? Can you find um, uh, cooked meals outside the market? Mm. Uh, so these things which are produced at home that have a market equivalent, it's called market replaceable uh, production. Okay. Then there's also the near market replaceable production, which is things which um, is more difficult for to replace, but yet it is done by the household. Things like uh, taking care of children, um, um, teaching them. Um, this would be, this would not be easily done by a maid. Mm. Teaching them and so on, mm. and also the uh, maid doesn't do like um, budgeting issues, you know. Um, but usually the the homemaker may do uh, planning and budgeting. Mm. So these are near market replaceable, but not perfectly replaceable. And then the third one, which I call non-market replaceable, maybe the conjugal relationships, the love, and you know, mm. all these things which are in addition to that. Mm. So household production, as I define it, comprise of these three items, the market replaceable, the, no, the near market replaceable, and the non-market replaceable. Mm. Right? Yeah, but essentially it is just home goods mm. produced by mm. time, a combination of time, mm 
and money. Mm. So talking about um, combination of time and money, so I would think that different people will take different time to complete a task. For example, someone might take one hour to cook a meal. Someone may take 30 minutes if they are going to do like instant noodles or what have you. So in this sense, how would one measure household production? Like kind of what are the variables that need to be taken account and how do we ensure it so it's like maybe we can say it's more equitable among like different levels of com- families, different income families and all of that? How would we measure it? Yeah, um, There are many ways to measure household production. Not so much as thinking about equitability, mm. but rather how do you actually quantify household production? Mm. And uh, in, I think most of the studies have used time use surveys. Mm. So you can have a detailed time use surveys as to what homemakers do at home. Mm. The cooking, how many hours they take a week, mm. you know, the cleaning, taking care of children, driving them to schools, um, uh, washing the floor. All these things are part and parcel of household production. Mm. So detailed studies have been produced on such time use activities mm. in the home. Mm. So that's one way to measure them because you need to measure them in order to apply the valuation methodologies mm. on them. Mm. If you cannot quantify household production, then you cannot put a valuation on mm. housework. Right? Mm. <coughs> but it's not a question of whether it's equitable or non-equitable. But of course, from the time use surveys, one can see uh, to what extent uh, home production done by uh, the various uh, the genders, right? Mm. So in, in, as it stands, even today, uh, from past years to today, mm. most of the housework or household production, mm. right, is done by women. Mm. So um, it continues to be a main task for women. Mm. Now, the, another problem with household production uh, measurement is that sometimes some tasks are done simultaneously mm. and the homemaker multitask. So they are simultaneous production, what you call joint production. Mm. So if that's the issue, then you have a difficulty in yes. how do you assign the time use for it. Mm. In, in most of the literature, when you deal with such things, of joint production and multitasking, then uh, in the surveys, they would ask which is the the one that they think is the primary job, mm. the, the primary use of the time. Mm. So they may do two things at one time, right? Um, they may be cooking something and then minding the children, looking at it, mm. but which the primary task for them, right? Mm. They, they will have to decide in the time use mm. surveys. So that's how they handle these type of things. So, so in this sense, does that mean the secondary task it will end up being a situation where the secondary task isn't taken into account and that's that right. makes the measurement to be less than accurate? That's right, that's right. Okay. But of course, if you add, um, in studies which add both times, uh, there'll be double counting mm. you know, yeah. for the use of the same yeah, time. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, so you, you, there's a trade-off involved in that sense. Mm. Mm. Prof, do you think the time use method is the best method or are there any other mechanisms to, to quantify household production? I think the time use survey is... The, the most accurate because normally what we do is we provide them like a diary, you know, a scheduled diary. Mm. So they, every time they do something, they will have to <coughs> fill in that diary. Rather than studies that based on recall, so you, some surveys just ask uh, homemakers how much time they spend on this. And this is based on recall method. Mm. And recall may not be accurate, but the time use surveys done properly, uh, diligently kept records would be the most accurate. <coughs> so I believe time use surveys is the the, the most accurate. Yeah. So um, going back to what you said earlier, Prof, about how women are the ones that are still doing uh, most of the care work, um, housework at home. Um, so this is also proven statistically because um, in the latest labor statistics released by uh, Malaysia last year, so for 2022, we found that 62.9% of working age women, they left the workforce because of um, family responsibilities and housework. In contrast, only 2.3% of the men left uh, the workforce because of these responsibilities. So my question is, Prof, how does the measurement of household production help to close these gender gaps at home and at the workplace? Yeah, so this is a, some kind of policy issue that mm. uh, you know, requires some, perhaps some government intervention. Mm. I think the reason why we, we observe more women uh, doing homemaking activities at home rather than in the labour market full-time mm. is primarily because of several factors. One is... Uh, there is a wage discrimination, mm. labour market discrimination in terms of wage d- gap between male and female yes. workers. Mm. And um, the greater the degree of this uh, gap would mean that the productivity of women right, in the market would be less than the productivity at home. Mm. 
And so this time use survey and this measurement of uh, household production and its valuation mm. would therefore provide information to the respective spouses as to what is their contribution at home versus the contribution in the market. So it provides some information for them to make some informed decision as mm. to the respective uh, differences in valuation. Mm. So in terms of government intervention, right, um, they might want to attempt to reduce this gap in wage differences. Mm. And in, by doing that, they will be able to therefore encourage more women uh, to work uh, in the labour market. Uh, because they, by closing this gap, if mm. the gap, the, the greater the degree of the, uh, the gap between uh, male and female uh, wage rates, then the t there'll be even more women staying at home rather mm. than working in the market. Mm. Now, I think one can also th think about um, things like, um, uh, perhaps there is also the, the gender role biases like, you mm. know, of society. So from young, you know, the, 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 when you have a female child, you know, they, they, the parents tend to ask the female child mm. to do a lot of housekeeping work, yeah. you know, and then the, the male child is spared from doing a lot of these things. Mm. So there is a, a kind of gender role uh, bias being taught from young by the parents. Mm. And so they grow up having this instinct to do this type of things, mm. you know, therefore sparing the male child from doing these things. Mm. And that is quite difficult to reverse. Uh, but if there is a campaign that uh, trying to encourage uh, the, the parents especially mm. uh, to treat both children as uh, equal and contributing mm. to the housework, that may reverse it in the future. Mm. Mm. Uh, um, but once it's ingrained, then it's difficult to, mm. to have this reversal of the gender roles. Uh. Mm. Um, and what about childcare centres? You know, if we have a, a lot more childcare centres, then it will perhaps take time uh, for take time off from the homemakers mm. uh, to be constantly around taking care of the children because they can then put the child into these childcare centres mm. freely available and so on. And therefore, they would therefore spend less time at home and perhaps working in the market. Yeah, that's probably something that the government should look into, I suppose. Um, basically, more accessible and affordable childcare uh, for the women in Malaysia as well. Because I know some studies or some research also has shown that some women actually prefer not to work because it's actually more costly to put their, their children into childcare. So I do think that's an importance, as you said, Prof, to basically look at all these childcare policies and policies for, for women in general to make it more gender friendly, I suppose. Yeah, I think mm. I want to bring out this subject about mm. COVID. No? Mm. So during COVID times, uh, people are locked down, so they are at home, mm. right? And so on, that will increase the home production activities rather than in the being spread out the time between market and, and being at home. So the value of how home production may actually increase during the COVID time, right? And the male spouse seeing how much for the first time they actually see uh, close up what their female spouse is doing at home uh, may make them appreciate more about the contribution by the female spouse. So, therefore, that encourages perhaps the male to chip in uh, some of the work. Right? But there is a counter-argument to this, which is that it blurs the, the line between paid market work and unpaid housework. And so, women may find themselves even doing more during the COVID times because they it becomes, it becomes uh, again, their duty to do a lot of these housework activities and at the same time doing their work at home, mm. the paid market work at home. Mm. And so it's a question of balance between the two. Uh, you know. mm. But the COVID does serve this purpose of raising more awareness mm. to home production. Mm. The other thing is, of course, um, that if, if, if there is a COVID and lockdown, then the value of uh, working in the market by anybody is going to, um, the, the wage rate is going to go down, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the opportunity cost of remaining at home instead of working, actually, um, it, it goes down, mm -hmm. right? It goes down. And so therefore, it, the value of homemaking should increase. Yeah. yeah. But I suppose during COVID also, there has been studies done on uh, domestic um, duties during the COVID period. And I think it was also generally found that women still take on the bulk of the tasks yeah. as, suppo as opposed to their spouse. Yeah. So, uh, so Prof, you were saying that so the value of uh, household production will have gone up during COVID because of the amount of time that's spent um, 
home. being locked up at home. So you have basically more time and space to be doing housework. Mm -hmm. In this sense, does the valuation of uh, household production, is it, is it liable to change over the years? So like this year might be higher, next year might be lower, depending on what kind of circumstances? Of course. Basically, the labour force participation rate of, mm. of homemaker, homemaker mm. depends very much upon the opportunity cost of staying at home. Mm. And that opportunity cost will be higher the higher the wage rate or if the market is a very tight one, mm. right? So they can earn much more if they enter the labour market. And mm. so it makes it more costly the, the, long, the longer they stay out of the market. Mm. But uh, um, in periods of uh, recession or you know the river when the economy goes down right and so then the opportunity cost of uh, is becomes lower mm. because they they cannot fetch the same amount of uh, market wages had they gone to work at the time mm. and then there's a problem of searching for work as well so they will stay at home mm. so there's this um, this notion about this value of household production that can cushion the impact of a recession and bad years mm. uh, and by transferring the workers between the market paid market work to the unpaid homework. Mm. Uh, so by computing this value of household production, one can then see right, what impact it does to the GNP mm. or the GDP, whatever. And uh, sometimes one has to uh, appreciate that they, when you see increases in GDP, right, uh, you might want to know to what extent that comes from people in the the homemaking sector mm. moving to the paid market work sector mm. right so it gives you an illusion that GPP is very high but actually it's actually this transfer mm. or in a recession when they move out of it and the GDP goes down right and the media often reports on the GDP goes down and mm. so on and so forth uh, with great alarm but actually it's uh, again the homemake homemakers who are doing the paid work have come back to homemaking and doing the unpaid work mm. so Knowing what is the value of household production and measuring it is actually very important to understand these uh, changes in the economy over time. Mm -hmm. And of course, nothing is static, uh, which is mm -hmm. over time, economy does changes. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the value of homemaking depends very much upon the opportunity cost of time spent at home versus mm -hmm. the market. Mm. Are there <coughs> any existing countries that actually has taken household production when considering their GDP? As of now, uh, as far as I know, not really. But you can. What they do have done is studies from time to time mm. uh, on such measurements, mm. and sometimes they can compute satellite accounts, mm. what they call the supplementary accounts. Mm. So by all, by no means we should just try to incorporate household production estimates into the GDP. Mm. You can keep it separate. Mm. At least you will know uh, to what's what is happening to the household sector. Right? There's no need to in, to keep it there, mm. but people who value household produ household production also do it for other reasons. One is uh, uh, for in law, so when a homemaker gets killed on the road, mm. you want to calculate calculate what's the value of homemaking mm. to the family, and then you want to compensate the family for the loss of this household production. Right, so that's useful if you can compute the value. Mm. Another one is for divorce cases and matrimonial property settlements. Mm. Uh, you want a situation where you want to look at the contribution by the homemaker, mm. uh, which has perhaps not been working in the paid market work, but working in the home as a homemaker. Mm. So you want to compute the contribution mm. and try to to do a, a proper division of the matrimonial property mm. assets mm. upon divorce. Mm. So there are many good reasons as to why you want to value household production. Mm -hmm. mm. So, but despite the importance of it and all the benefits of measuring household production and appreciating um, unpaid housework and care work, I think as an overall, we can still agree that it's actually still rather unappreciated. So how can we increase the awareness regarding the significance of unpaid housework? And how do we advocate for the formal recognition so that we could um, support the homemakers, especially those who do not hold another job? You know, how some, uh, I'm a homemaker and I'm also a paid employee. So how do we value those homemakers? Yeah, I think for, for a start, uh, we must recognize that whether you contribute in the paid market work or you contribute at home, they are both productive activities. They generate goods production, right? So 
It's not that you do one and, and mm-hmm. that one is worth more than the other one. Mm-hmm. It's both are equally important. So such measurements and valuation for household production, therefore, becomes uh, paramount. Mm. That any state sh- should actually try to have these studies done from time to time, mm. uh, and just to understand uh, changes in the economy, labor force participation rate, useful for the other purposes I mentioned earlier. Mm. And I think that it is also important that perhaps uh, what society itself. Can recognize uh, the contribution made by homemakers, mm-hmm. because if you have a good homemakers, uh, caring, and dedicated to their family, the result is that it, there would be less dysfunctional family. Mm-hmm. So society saves the burden of having to devote resources to to manage and monitor dysfunctional families. Mm-hmm. So the homemaker therefore does this role. If that is, if that is recognized. That means the homemaking activity uh, has a positive spillover effect on the eco- on the rest of society. Mm. Therefore, society should recognize, and therefore society should reward homemakers. Mm. Then the whole question is, uh, how do you actually reward homemakers? Right? So I think in the in the case of Malaysia, there is a scheme that they came out to recommend uh, to, to contribute uh, through a fund, right, mm. to the homemakers themselves. Mm. I think. That constitutes an important start, mm. although the numbers may be small, mm. but it still brings awareness of this con- of this contribution, mm. and this may change over time, right? Um, then the question is: Sometimes people say, uh, "Why don't the the male spouse uh, con- pay compensation to the female?" Uh, mm. th- you know. So th- then the questions. There's a question about marriage. Mm. What is a marriage? What is love? And so yeah. that comes a very sensitive issue mm. and difficult to, to handle. Then there's the other part. Of, some people say that maybe the the employers should pay to pay the the worker because the worker is productive due to the home uh, homemaker, yeah. right? So the, the employer should pay the homemaker, right? But that is perhaps double counting because mm. if if the homemaker takes care, takes good care of the family, then the the spouse working in the paid sector will be more productive. Mm. And when more productive means that the, he or she will may be rewarded mm. by the company, right? Yeah. And uh, through bonus, through promotion right. earlier, so it's already uh, in a sense compensated. Mm. So to me, the most import, the most uh, relevant part about recognizing homemakers and making sure they are rewarded is th- that society mm. should pay mm. right, and through one of those uh, funds that they set up to pay for them. Mm. Right. So uh, I just want to go back to a point that you made earlier, Prof, that's quite important because you mentioned that you know within the family, sometimes it becomes quite entrenched that growing up as kids, like the <coughs> daughters will be doing certain tasks and the sons will be doing certain tasks. And that's certainly true because... I myself don't have any brothers, so we're all sisters and we all do our equal share. Mm-hmm. But I do have friends who have brothers and they told me that their brothers do nothing. Mm-hmm. So basically, after dinner, it's like, okay, um, you go and wash the dishes, you go and clear the table, and then mm-hmm. the brothers would just run off and play and do whatever they like. So I guess in this sense, my question to you is, is there any way that we could use valuation frameworks or how do we basically teach the parents or the mother or the father, how do we put this into perspective that so this doesn't become something that's entrenched, so these gender stereotypes does not continue for the future generation? Now, this is a difficult question mm. because this is already entrenched <laughs> yeah. in our society. To uh, disentangle it, uh, one needs perhaps education. Uh, as I said, one is a, a campaign uh, to, to show that actually... Um, uh, homemaking activity should be the purview of both uh, the son and the daughters, you know, and and and, and so that when they grow up, they don't um, behave to the old gender bias. Mm. Uh, but as I say, it's not easy. One has to start from when they are young, and to to inculcate that, one has to educate the parents, right, of doing that, and it's not easy, of course. Mm. But having said that too. Um, uh, the famous Nobel laureate in economics, Gary Becker, uh, who has done a lot of writings on home production, he has argued uh, that at one point that um, 
where, where you define house of production as combination of time you know, and market goods to produce the home goods, right? And one can think in terms of uh, looking at this gender bias itself, you know, uh, that is why you observe females work more in the household's housework mm. than the male child, right? Uh, let's say cooking, for example. Clearly, men and women can do both work. But because of this gender bias over time, then the women actually uh, cook better because they got more experience doing the thing compared to the men. And so the result is that it, will, it just strengthens this gender bias, actually not reduce it, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because they, the women as homemakers do better job given the same amount of time mm-hmm. compared to the men. And so over time, both genders uh, specialize in different things, even within the homemaking sector. Mm-hmm. So maybe the, 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 the male child will be doing, uh, or they grow up and they'll be doing changing the light bulbs, uh, tinkering with repairs, mm-hmm. uh, and the more heavier stuff. But the women will be doing the other normal kind of housekeeping, housekeeping. activities, mm-hmm. right? So it, it leads to some kind of division of labor and specialization. So one argument is that um, it, may, it may be just this division of labor that perpetuates this continued mm-hmm. gender bias. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know how you disentangle it by mm-hmm. that easily uh, yeah. when it comes to even efficiency consequences of it. Yeah. It's definitely a very difficult issue to disentangle because you have to think about cultural, social norms. Different cultures have different expectations and, and all of that as well. Yeah, yeah. but as I said, as, uh, maybe as education too mm. plays a part in, mm. uh, and continue campaigns to make sure that parents understand uh, that homemaking is a responsibility of both children. Mm. I suppose to start that off, the father would have to assume more responsibility in the household in the first place as well. Yes. I, I just wanted to pick up on, on the possibilities of society compensating uh, uh, women in, you know, for home production or household production. What are the possibilities in terms of if you are to pay everybody who contributes to the household production, how would, for example, men be paid because they're usually the ones driving, I mean, from my small circle of friends, um, the ones driving the children to school or, I mean, of course not everybody, but how would they be compensated if we take other household chores, for example, fixing the light bulbs and the wiring, if that is part of household production, are there possibilities of men being paid for that? I mean, those gendered roles, you know, fixing the house and... Security, yeah, security. <laughs> for example. Yeah, yeah. Are there possibilities yeah, yeah. of yeah. addressing yeah. that? Yeah, I understand the question. But uh, <laughs> that's why I said that housework is not just a scene from the park. It cannot be just, say, a woman that does the housework. It's just that the woman do more of the housework. Yeah. There are some parts of the housework, of course, clearly is the role of the man, and the man does it. So when you talk about contributing to homemaking, uh, it, contribution to uh, homemakers, it actually involves both men and women. Yeah. I, I don't distinguish between, you know, whether it's a woman or it's a man, as long as you contribute to homemaking. Yes, yeah. Society as a whole benefit from this, mm. and society therefore sets up an account pay. But um, again, we're talking about full time homemakers, not part time homemakers. Mm. Although, that's, if you can measure uh, how much the part time workers c- contribute and so on, then actually society as a whole is engaged in this activity. But the problem with the full-time homemakers is that they are not engaged in market work. Mm. Therefore, they have no remuneration mm. at all. Uh, but clearly, they are doing an important job and they should be rewarded for that job. Okay, then perhaps one last question that I have is uh, more of a qualitative one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something that I've, I've been wondering about for some time. So, you have non-valuation or misvaluation of work. So, it's not just uh, unpaid housework or underpaid work such as usually a lot of women's work are are underpaid the secretaries and nurses and teaching jobs these are all i think a lot of people would say these are underpaid although they they work very hard and they work long hours Um, but it also applies to uh, other people who are underpaid and sometimes overwork for example 3d jobs for migrants right for example, so my question is on uh, generally the misrecognition of people doing their their jobs. As I said, such works are not valued, or they're not as valued as as other works. 
So what counts as valuable jobs, who can fill those jobs, and how they are socially evaluated? These happen to be not arbitrary, but some people would argue these are actually decided by people who are in power, groups that are in power. Uh, they determine that nursing jobs get paid less, for example, whereas other, other jobs are paid more. So behind the question of quantitative measurement of housework, or any work done by any sections of society, there's a qualitative, or in other words, social, a cultural question of who gives this recognition that this work is valuable, who deserves recognition, and what gets recognized as being of worth or of value. So, um, so as I said, the same questions could be asked about the misvaluation of factory work, for example, fishermen, farming, plantation work, construction, artisan work, teaching, policing, white-collar clerical work. So, so my question is, how would you respond to the proposal that in order to achieve the proper valuation or measurement of housework, there needs to be a re-valuation or reorganization of the present structure of values, societal values. People don't value teaching enough. They don't recognize its value, and so they pay very little. But just like police work, it's highly valuable, but it's undervalued in terms of remuneration. So yeah. applying that to the question of housework, perhaps what some people would argue it's we need to reorganize societal values yeah. as a whole as opposed to looking for ways to quantify. Yeah, so I understand your question. Uh, and uh, to answer your question in one simple word, uh, the market does the valuation. Mm. Right, so if you are thinking of all these powerful people, lobby groups, well, they intervene in the market, but as long as they don't uh, uh, present sufficient obstacles to the market, the market will still function based on demand and supply. Mm. So whether somebody's remuneration should be paid so much, so much, it depends upon, again, what is the demand for this kind of workers, what is the supply number of these workers, right? So you would expect that with large supply of these type of workers, then the wage rate will be lower than what it should be. Um, so sometimes we may quibble. Why is the CEO paid so much, you know, compared to another person doing a very important work, mm. right? And that you, the CEO pays, yeah, gets away with uh, how many times larger than that person's worker. But you can say that for any occupation. And it's for any occupation in any society, right? To me, it's not for us to really question or intervene in the market because I believe that if the market is left to operate by itself through the elements of demand and supply it will sort itself out what is who is needed and mm. so on right if you try to intervene in the market and block uh, let's say have a wage ceiling for some some kind of occupation you are going to start getting uh, supply problems supply issues uh, and if you do it for one society or one country that these people will go elsewhere to other countries where mm -hmm. the labor market is allowed to operate freely. Mm -hmm. So uh, searching for talents, for example, is a worldwide, worldwide activity. If you pay low or if you try to control their wages, they will just go elsewhere. And I think, again, depends on what the society really wants. But I think the reorganizing of pay and so on cannot be done unless it is a totally totalitarian society mm. and that becomes even more difficult because then uh, someone or some committee or some have to decide uh, what wages they should pay for all the different types of occupation mm. uh, what is enough who is overpaid who is underpaid somebody has to decide all these things and fix it but I think if you leave it in the market the market solves all these things uh, beautifully so if you if you underpay then you don't get people coming to your firm and they go to elsewhere. If you, right, if you underpay, nobody will go and work for you. And so if the market is allowed to freely operate and that free op operation involves a lot of comp competitive elements, then you can expect the wages derived would reflect the society's valuation for these types of occupation. So while we may not like certain scenarios, but the market does decide I think in, in, a, in a much better way than a non-market way of deciding. Mm. And although the market may take some time to adjust because they may not get all the, uh, it is not instantaneous adjustment and there is a lag time effect before the market adjusts to the what wage rate that would prevail in the market. Uh, 
so the, that's where the government intervention may come in to ensure that the maximum information flows to all the economic agents in the market so that they know uh, what is the current supply trend and so on uh, and what is the is there excess demand in certain areas and so on, right so there's some of course there's some kind of manpower planning also for a country right? and they have this responsibility also to plan properly so that they they try not to have this over this excess demand excess supply situation and the market clears up basically mm. so i guess i um, i don't have a ready like good answer for you uh, because it involves perhaps non-economic factors the mm. kind of question that you are mm. talking about well, social value and the morals uh, i think it involves all these kind of issues uh, but i still think that the market handles it very well mm. unless you try to prevent the market from operating and that becomes problematic mm. but can we apply that same principle to housework i mean the market is not willing to compensate women uh, for for the housework but there should be other ways of compensating them and and you were i mean one of the suggestions i think is society somehow compensates yeah. uh, so it's it's a state compensating for market uh-huh. failures the market inability to to address these gaps i mean does it or it doesn't apply to well all mostly all non market goods uh, it's a form of uh, involving some kind of market failures and mm. market failures means state intervention mm. and state intervention means that in the like in the case of pollution then the state intervenes mm. and the pollution tax and so on and so forth right so in the case of the house making activities one must determine how much value does the house making activity contributes to a particular society to mm. a particular economy mm. it's not necessary that they uh, all contribute very highly in every society right mm. it depends right mm. uh, so first the measurement the valuation must take place mm. and therefore the where it, where the government feels or where society feels that perhaps more people should be spent uh, away from the market contributing at home or conversely more people should be working in the paid market work than standing at home mm. then policies can be directed to try to influence the labor force participation rate and that could come in the form of um uh one is the secure social security payments mm. contributions right the kind of reward that we think about if we want to encourage them to go into the market the other is uh trying to close the gender wage discrimination in the labor market so to reverse meaning to co- to encourage more homemakers to go into the market mm. so influence in either direction can yes. take place so mm. this is a form where still the va- information mm. on valuation and measurement house production Uh, must take place first. Mm. Yeah. So, Prof, as a final question to you, mm. can you share with us on how does your household share the domestic duties? Yeah. So we believe in division of labor. Mm. Well, meaning that uh, my wife, being more capable in household production, right, takes care of much of the household activities, mm. and uh, because of the nature of my work and demands my time outside the home, mm. so normally I contribute in the case of the market work uh, than. the non market work but of course my wife is also working so sometimes it's a uh, uh, difficult on her to handle both the homework as well as the paid market work uh, so um, but uh, where i can i help but we do decide on the basis of in terms of efficiency of contribution of the home making activity and versus the paid market work efficiency is definitely a very important thing as well when we're talking about housework Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> thank you so much, Prof. Kwa, for spending time with us today. Thank I you. think um, we are all very enlightened on the issues of uh, why is it important to value household production in recognizing the contribution of housewives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kwa. Thank you very much.